one way, we're very good at thinking. We can think all day long and think nothing of it. It seems like the most normal and natural thing for the mind to do. But in another way, we're not very good at thinking, because so many times our thoughts make us suffer. And people can kill themselves over the issues that their thinking brings up. And even if your thoughts don't lead you to the point of despair, they can, they can just drive you crazy, like a dog that barks all night long. It doesn't accomplish anything. It's a waste of effort. So when we're meditating, one of the purposes is to get so that we really are good at thinking. In other words, thinking when it's useful and resting when it's not. So first you want to think about how important it is to be able to rest. Give the mind a chance that it doesn't have to keep churning its wheels all the time. Think about how nice that would be. This is called a useful, beneficial use of your thinking. And then think about ways that you could get the mind to settle down. And this is another useful use of thinking. For instance, you can keep the breath in mind. Just keep reminding yourself, stay with the breath. Be sensitive to the breath. That kind of thinking is called mindfulness, and it's very useful. You want to couple it with alertness, which is watching the breath. Noticing how the breath feels when it doesn't feel good, you can change it. You don't have to put too much pressure on it to change. Just think. Try longer breathing and see what happens. Then think. Try shorter breathing. See what happens. Deeper, more shallow, faster, slower, heavier, lighter. Experiment with the breath for a while to see how it feels, what feels best. If you find the mind slipping off, just bring it right back and try to make the breath more comfortable as a way of getting the mind more interested in the breath again. This combination of mindfulness and alertness is a skillful use of thinking. It takes a while. As with any skill, it takes a while to master a skill. So don't be upset if you can't do it right away. It's like playing the piano. Very few people can sit down at the piano for the first time and play Mozart. Most of us have to work with the scales. and. When we begin, it doesn't sound all that good, but after a while we begin to develop the muscles in our fingers, and we also de begin to develop the ability to listen, to see what sounds good, what doesn't sound good. So be patient. Just keep at it. And over time, you get more and more skilled in this way, at this skillful use of your thinking. The purpose of which is to get the mind to quiet down. No matter what other interesting thoughts, fascinating thoughts, or important-seeming thoughts may come up in the mind as you're trying to get it to st calm down, you don't have to pay them any attention. You can think those thoughts any other time. Right now is a good time to practice this new skill, the skill of bringing the mind to stillness and oneness. And it takes thought, mindful thought, combined with alertness, to get the mind to settle down. As these skills get stronger, the Buddha changes the names he gives to them. He calls them directed thought and evaluation, in other words, you really are focused on what you're doing. All your thinking relates to the breath. And then you evaluate with more and more skill what really feels best right now. 
not only in terms of the breath, but in terms of the pressure of your focus. Sometimes you can bear down too heavily on the breath, so everything in the body feels confined and clamped down. That's not good. Or if your focus is too light, it just floats away. That's not good either. You want the amount of pressure to be just right. The classic simile is of trying to hold a baby chick in your hands. If you squeeze it too tight, it dies. If you hold it too loosely, it flies away. So again, through practice you begin to get a sense of how much is too much pressure, how much is little, and exactly where is just right. Remembering that just right may change with circumstances. But again, that's something you learn through experience. The basic principle is always the same. Keep directing your thoughts to this one thing and then evaluate to see how it's going and make adjustments wherever necessary. This is how you use thinking in order to get the mind to rest from its thinking. Because there will come a point where the breath feels good enough, everything feels settled within the body, and you can just let your awareness become one with the breath. You can drop the, all that evaluation. You don't have to keep reminding yourself to stay with the breath because you're right there. That's when the mind gets really focused in. its object. It seems like the, the breath permeates your awareness, your awareness permeates the breath. You feel solid and at home, and everything feels just right. Some people will tell you, though, that getting the mind to this state of broad, open awareness that one in the present moment, that once that happens, then you can trust whatever comes up in the mind, whatever insights arise. The Buddha never taught that way, though. He said you have to put these things to the test. And also learn to ask the right questions. This is, in a, quali this is a quality that the texts call appropriate attention. Because once the mind is still and you come out of that stillness, you could focus it on anything at all, your, power, your improved powers of concentration. Or if it so happens that an interesting idea or an interesting insight comes popping into your mind when the mind is still, it's very easy to latch on to it and say, oh, this must really be true because it comes out of the stillness. But the Buddha said you can't be so sure. This is why you want to direct your attention in the right direction, which is to watch whatever comes up in the mind as an event, as part of a causal process. When this thought comes, where does it lead? When that thought comes, where does it lead? Does it lead you where you want to go? Or if you believe this particular thought, where would it lead you? If you believe the opposite, where would it lead you? What difference would it make? Because there are a lot of thoughts that just don't make any difference at all in how you conduct your life. Because as the Buddha said, the big question in life is, what are you doing that's causing suffering? Can you learn how to stop? Other questions can carry you away into abstractions. Where does the world come from? Are there deities out there that can help you? Is the world finite? Is it infinite? Is it eternal? Is it not eternal? In most religions and most teachings, those are the big questions. Are What am I? Who am I? What is the meaning of my life? The Buddha said, you can never come to the end trying to answer those questions. He called them a thicket of views, a wilderness of views. You just get lost. But there is one question that you can answer and that you can find a solution for, and that's why you're suffering. Why is there suffering? Wisdom, he says, comes from learning to ask the question, what, when I do it, will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness? Now, this may seem selfish, but true happiness can't rely on the suffering of other people. If it did, they would be doing everything they could to stop it, and it wouldn't last very long. 
So that's one of the first things you have to realize about long-term welfare and happiness. It has to depend on the welfare and happiness of other people, too. That way they won't harm it. But you've also got the insight in there that it's going to depend on your actions. You can't blame your happiness or sorrow on other people. It's not, and it's not that you blame it on yourself. The word blame is not appropriate here. You're trying to figure out where the things, these things come from so you can solve the problem. So instead of saying that I'm to blame, you say, what mental states are to blame? Because the mind has all kinds of mental states. There's mindfulness and there's lack of mindfulness. There's sensual desire, ill will, torpor and lethargy, restlessness and anxiety, uncertainty. All of these get in the way. These are the things that cause you to do unskillful things. So more, on a deeper level, passion, aversion, and delusion. These are the qualities of the mind that cause you to do unskillful things. But there are also times in the mind where there's no passion, no aversion, no delusion, everything is very clear. And at times like that, you tend to act in skillful ways. So it's not a question that you are a bad person causing suffering. It's just that some of your thoughts, some of the qualities in your mind cause suffering. Other qualities don't cause suffering. You've got to learn how to sort them out. And a still mind is the best place to do that. The more you can resist the pull of thoughts, the easier it is to see them for what they are. Most of us are like someone who's standing by the side of the road. Somebody drives up on a motorcycle and says, hop on, and you hop on, and then you go. And only then do you stop to ask, okay, who are you? Where are you taking me? Are you a hell's angel? Who are you? And by that time, it's too late. If it really is a hell's angel, you're in big trouble. You want to be confident enough in where you're standing so that when someone drives up on a motorcycle and says, hop on, you say, well, who are you? I'm not going to go with you unless you explain a lot of things. Where are you going to take me? And then if you get a good answer and the motorcycle driver seems to be honest, okay, then you then you can hop on. In other words, there are patterns of thought that are helpful. It's not that we're trying to snuff out thought forever. The Buddha never said that thinking is suffering, therefore stop thinking. He never said that. He said clinging is suffering. We hold on to things that, with the hope that they'll give us happiness, and they don't. So if you can put the mind in a position where it doesn't have to cling, where it can use things simply as tools and then put them down when they've succeeded in their, their intended purpose, then you don't have to suffer. So we get the mind still so that we can understand its thinking even more. Sort out. This is called analysis of qualities. It's the technical term. What it literally means is you look at what's coming up in the mind and you decide whether it's going to be skillful or not, and you see clearly. Okay, if it's skillful, it's going to lead to true happiness. If it's unskillful, it's going to lead you in the other direction. And you can make a choice. So it's not that thinking is bad. It's just that some thinking leads to suffering and other thinking doesn't. And we want to put ourselves in a position where we can see clearly which is which. That's why we're working on getting the mind still right now, because it's only through getting the mind still that you can put it into that position, the position where it can see things clearly for what they are, where it can ask the questions that are really, really useful to ask and get clear answers. Answers that will make a difference in our lives that teach us along the path to true happiness. Along the way, we may not be all the way there yet, but at least we find that we are getting more skillful in how we use our minds. Not that we're trying to figure out abstract problems, but we see more clearly what we're doing and what the results are going to be. So you can choose more wisely. The Buddha said, this is what wisdom is all about. There are things that you like to do, but you know they're going to cause harm. And so you learn not to do them. There are things that you don't like to do that you know will 
cause happiness. And you figure out ways to get yourself to do them. As for the things that cause harm and you don't like to do, those are no-brainers. The same with things that you like to do that will cause happiness. Those are no-brainers, too. It's these other two. Those are the problems. But if you develop the insight, if you develop the proper sense of values, if you develop appropriate attention, learning how to look at your life in a way that asks the, pro the proper questions and gets you to act in skillful ways, that's what real wisdom is all about. It really does make a difference in your life. So this is why this skill of bringing the mind to stillness is so important, because it puts you in the position where you can develop that skill to the full.